those people on the other side of the glass just wow. screaming. Was there an applause sign or something? I don't know. Calm down. Very enthusiastic. You have complete control of the room. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Hey, everybody, welcome. We are live. <laughs> welcome to the Atheist Experience. I'm your host, Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, uh, a new friend of mine, Dave Warnock. Yes, glad to be here. Very excited. Welcome. You were on Talk Ethan uh, just a couple hours ago. I was. We had so, a blast. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do more of that and, uh, and a little bit more. For those of you who aren't aware, we're going to you know, go through and let... I'm going to talk with Dave for a while because there's some interesting parts of his story and stuff that I think is in, incredibly valuable. There's a number of resources that we're going to mention uh, throughout the show, and on the off chance that we don't, I figured I'd start off by just reminding people about Recovering from Religion, the Secular Therapist Project, Parenting Beyond Belief, Foundation Beyond Belief, Grief Beyond Belief, uh, and all, all of these you know, secular resources that are out there for people particularly those people who've had to deal with things in an entirely religious context or who are constantly dealing with family members who only want to view it from a religious context. Um, we'll get to all that. It is Sunday, August 11th, 2019, unless it's not because you're watching this after we recorded it, but I'm going to speak in my present tense, which is already your past tense, uh, because this thing goes out on a delay. So I actually said that like a few seconds before you even heard it, if you were watching it live. This is all true. Yeah. Remember that, actually, because that may become relevant a little later. Dave and I were having a conversation about uh, the limits of the mind, and, and I'm doing a couple videos about how they, they demonstrate the, the absurdity of most God notions. Uh, but as a reminder, we are now, it's August 11th, we are now one month and 10 days away from the ACA's annual bat cruise. And I'm sure they'll have a link posted, oh, like right there any second now where you can go uh, to get tickets and find out more. For the record, what th the normal procedure for the bat cruise is on the day of the event, we have a guest lecturer come in and talk for a while. That's all free and open to the public. And then um, in the evening, just before sunset, we go down, we get on uh, a boat or two, uh, as was the case last year and I think this year. Uh, where you can bring food, snacks, drinks, other stuff, and just hang out and visit with a bunch of godless heathens or people who are friends or family with godless heathens. It's not no guarantee that the people on the boat are going to be, you know, atheists at any given moment. Um, and then uh, a good chunk of us will go to the 10 p.m. Esther's Follies show uh, after that's over. There will be more announcements coming up. There's a board meeting this Tuesday uh, right up here at the building at 7. Uh, Bat Cruise is number one on the agenda to get... Stuff is that the down place on. where they have bats that hang out? I've heard about that. A lake or something where there are a bunch of bats? Yeah. What's up with that? What's the deal? Austin has the largest metropolitan bat population in the world. There's I don't understand. Over what, a what million bats live under the Congress Street Bridge. Why? Like, why wouldn't they? I just don't understand. Because there's not, there's not a cave handy for them where they grew up and we built a bridge? Uh, yeah, I, I caught up a couple of bats when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Took them to science class. We dissected them. Cool. Yeah, just to I guess. Up. I don't know. I just thought of that when you said bats. So. See, my science classes actually got reliable and responsibly sourced things for us to learn no, in biology. We, we did wild bats. <laughs> You're from Tennessee, though. No, Arkansas. You're Arkansas. Worse. Oh, my God. Yeah, I grew up in Arkansas, so you do things like that in Arkansas. Yeah, and, and I'm I remember. I'm surprised we didn't eat them. I'm surprised we didn't meet. I mean, because, like, so I went to Camp Windermere on Lake the Ozarks in southern Missouri when yeah, I was there. Uh, I grew up in the Ozarks. Yeah. I have family all over the Ozarks. Wow. Uh, I don't know that I ever caught a bat and took it to school, but. Two bats. Two, yeah. yeah. I'm not going to be able to compete with Dave in the <laughs> bat catching department. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it, wow, we went down a rabbit trail fast. It's a million bats. They're there till yeah, I've heard about that. Starts cooling off, and then they're you know, they're Mexican short-tailed bats, I believe, and then wow. they head south to Mexico, and then they come back in the spring. I'd like to do the bat cruise. All right, let's make it happen. What do you got going on September twenty-first? Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll sort it out after the show. Yeah, maybe, I'd maybe love to come, get Dave back down for the. That'd bat be great. Cruise. Uh, and actually, it might be. Let's talk after the show. We will. So. What are you doing here, Dave? What wow. brought you to Austin to come hang out with us? I am doing a thing called Dying Out Loud. And what that means is I'm talking about dying because I am dying. And not to say that's, you know, everyone says, yeah, we're all dying. Um, a few months ago, I was diagnosed with ALS, mm -hmm. which is Lou Gehrig's disease, which gives me, um, prognosis-wise, three to five years to live after onset of symptoms, which I've had for a year and a half. So... But that varies greatly from person to person. So I could have, you know, more years than that. I could actually take a 
turn for the worse, and it could uh, it could get worse quickly. But right now, it's moving slowly. So I'm I'm talking about dying as an atheist because I used to be an evangelical Christian for 37 years and pastor, uh, church leader for much of those years, and so my experience or my worldview has shifted 180 degrees and. Whereas before, I would look at death in a certain way as a Christian where there's an afterlife and an eternal life and, and all of those things that Christianity teaches, evangelical Christianity anyway. Uh, now I'm looking at death as an atheist and I'm talking out loud about it because I think it's something we don't need to be afraid of. I think it's something that's just the natural uh, extension of living. And, and the, the other part I'm talking about with dying out loud is what we call living out loud or what I call living out loud. Um, and that simply means that because life is short, because this is the one life we know we have, and because it's precious and brief and, and it's filled with wonderful moments and it's enough, we don't have to have an afterlife. This life should be and could be and will be enough if we make it that way. I'm talking about living, grabbing the moments. Um, carpe the fucking diem is a phrase I use. And um, it's, it's just about looking for and seizing the moments in life and making the most of them, not letting life pass you by, not letting life just happen to you, but grabbing the pen, writing your own story, and, and living life on your terms. And that's, that's the gist of what I'm talking about. There's a number of people that I, I could potentially interact with who might be in a similar position um, with varying religious beliefs, theist of some stripe or atheist, whatever. I think one of the first things is... like. From the time of when you were diagnosed mm -hmm. until you started to do this, you know, dying out loud, what was your process? Were you pissed off for a while? Did you, were you, did you, you know, wail at the cosmos and... Yeah, no, I didn't do any of that. Um, I've been an atheist for about eight years, and so I pretty much let go of any sense that there's anything in the cosmos that would, that would give a shit. Um, and so I, it was a very... Um, sobering moment, you know, to get that diagnosis on February 26th, about nine o'clock in the morning. Not like you remember that or anything, but you know. Um, so I just really um, told the people that were, were knew I was, I was getting checked out, told uh, family members, and immediately um, just started figuring out what do I want to make of the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And I pretty much, I knew that I talked to a few people immediately that uh, immediately when you tell people this, you get the folks who, who come back with, hey, so-and-so had that and they went there and did this and they saw this person and they went to New England and had these tests and they had this guy do this. And I was inundated with that and I thought, okay, do I want to spend the rest of my life scrambling around trying to stay alive or do I want to live? And I decided I wanted to live. And so I thought, you know what, what does that look like? Um, I retired from the work I was doing. I was doing. I was working in the insurance business, and I retired from that. I moved out of my apartment in downtown Nashville, and with some friends in a suburb of Nashville, and lightened my load and started selling stuff and giving stuff away. I mean, when we moved the stuff out of my apartment, um, people were there, and I was just saying, "If you want that, take it. If you want this, take it. I, I don't need this shit anymore." So I just started deciding I'm going to travel as much as I can, see the places in the world I want to see get with people. To me, the most value, valuable commodity in the world, and it's not a commodity, is human interaction and community with people, connecting with human beings, hugging someone's neck, looking them in the eye and saying, I love you and you're important to me. And I wanted to get to those people and spend as much time with them as I could. And so I just started thinking of how can I do that? What can I do to make that happen? And that's how this kind of developed this organic thing of of uh, getting on, and Marie uh, started reaching out to podcasts and uh, places like you guys and uh, humanist churches, Unitarian churches. I'm sure. speaking just everywhere I can. I'm trying to get anywhere I can just to talk about the things that I think are valuable, and I'm getting incredible feedback from people that it's it's mattering to them. So, so you're a former pastor, pastor, been an atheist for a while, but mm -hmm. you also live in the Nashville area, which uh, I find Nashville is a curious mi mixed bag. It is. Uh, it, it it's like an Austin that's a little more Trumpified. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, Sadly. Because there's a lot of fun. And what I find quite often is that, you know, you get the, the evangelical, fundamentalist, religious folks, and yet if I put them up against the evangelical, fundamentalist people I grew up with in Missouri, 
there's a little bit of a difference there. It's it's like these folks are serious about it, and these folks are serious about it, but we're all here together, and we're going to have a little bit more fun. When you when you got to this point, and you got your diagnosis, and you're talking with friends, I'm assuming you've got friends and family who are, well, for lack of another word, obnoxious theists who immediately shoved things, you know, that God has a plan, or or even perhaps even blame of, you know, this happened because you've fallen away. I have those most of my most of my family brother mother uh, sister they all live in Texas here and they're evangelical conservatives they didn't do that to me because they know better than to do that because when I deconverted a few years back my brother who's a pastor in East Texas of a big evangelical church he made several runs at me to try to uh, uh, convince me of how wrong I was and how deceived by the devil I was and those kind of things so anyone in my family or friends who would have um, who would have been inclined to make that kind of a, a run at me with this disease uh, had already done that, and they knew it wouldn't go anywhere. Sure. So it, I didn't get that. Now, you know, I got some, I'm praying for you, and I, I did show up at a poker game with some of my old holdover friends. These guys are all uh, people that used to be in my church. I used to be their pastor, and now we all play poker together. And then now I'm an atheist, you know. I don't hold back from anybody. And uh, this one guy, he shows up, Tony, and he's drunk already. And he says, man, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you right now. And he laid his hands on me. I said, Tony, don't do that. No, man, I'm going to pray for you. God's going to hear you right now. No, I said, no, he's not. No, he's not. <laughs> so I've had a few of those. But by and large, people, basically the Christians have just left me alone. They've been quite silent. I take it, For me, I take a lot of that. I mean, you get to a point where you're frustrated. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, oh, yes, thank you, you're praying for me, oh, whatever, thank yeah, you. whatever. Thank um, I, I don't always respond the same way to people saying they're praying for me. I would like to be fairly consistent and say, I understand that this is what people say when they can't think of anything better to say, when they are incredibly frustrated. It's like, oh, there's nothing I can do to possibly make you feel better, right. so I'm going to let you know I'm praying for you. It, it's in the same, you know, I don't get mad when somebody says, oh, I hope you recover. Right. Uh, I mean, that's what they're doing, I, essentially. I wish you weren't ill. Yeah. It's, okay, wish and hope and you feel pray. better pray and just pray i don't care yeah. it's not going to make any difference but there comes a point where where it becomes weaponized mm-hmm. uh, and that's a little it's a little passive aggressive in my opinion because yeah. uh, like with my evangelical pastor brother that i get a text a couple of days after the diagnosis he says i got the news brother been praying for you ever since um hope to get to see you soon so blah 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 and to me, that's his message telling me, because he knows how I feel about that. He knows that I know it's bullshit, or I think it's bullshit. And so for him to, to send that message, not even call me, by the way, but send the message by text, is basically saying, by the way, I'm right about these things, and you're yes. wrong about these things, just so you know. That's uh, probably one of the most viewed clips from me in the past year was uh, my 50th birthday. Yeah. When I got a card from my I, I watched parent. that. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I read it. And the, the biggest reason I read it was to let people know, yes, I actually deal with this stuff too. You're right. not alone. Right. Uh, and, you know, I sat there and was like, okay, 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 okay. Until I just, nope, this far and no further. There's there's a line. It's not even the sand. I put it in the concrete when I poured it. You're not coming any further than this. Yeah, you got to draw a line someplace. And it's it's all about taking care of yourself. Now, you're, you're in this position you are traveling around, you're doing podcasts, uh, interviews, reaching out, meeting people in different communities. What are the... I, I remember that song because um, I listened to everything. Everything. Um, there was a country song about uh, Live Like You're Dying. Yeah, Tim McGraw. Yeah. And it, it's large... I mean, there's some Jesus-y stuff in there a little bit uh, too, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's largely a positive message. It is. I get that impression from you, but what is it... Like, set aside whether or not t- tomorrow things go worse or there's a miracle cure tomorrow. You've learned something fundamental about your life that you want to share with people. Mm-hmm. What, are the, what are the number one things that you wish people would just, that, that frustrate the crap out of you that people just don't seem to realize? Um, that life is, is precious. I, I've, I just, um, it's, it's brief, it's precious, it's um, unpredictable, it's chaotic. Um, the bigger thing that I took away, and I, I got this epiphany a few years ago when I rebooted my life after a divorce and um, decided I was going to live life on my own terms and not tiptoe around and try to accommodate other people and just be honest and authentic. And the the epiphany I had was that life is nothing more than a collection of moments. There's no big ar- arching plan. There's no scheme that fits it all together. This moment can stand alone. It doesn't have to connect to a moment next week or next month or next year. 
And so that being said, that means that what do I, what do I take from this moment, this day? And the other part of that is, is that we do not remember days, we remember moments. That's a, a plaque I had on my wall, in my bookshelf. And um, it simply means that, that the moments that we, that we live, the, the, the life that we're living, if they're, they're made up of, of a huge number of beautiful moments if we're looking for them, if we're making room for them, and if we're recognizing them. And the, the fact that we don't recognize them, that we're not uh, grabbing the moments in life, means that we're caught up in stuff. Oftentimes, we're caught up in stuff that doesn't matter. And, and a lot of times, with us as ex-Christians, we're letting other people dictate that. And a lot of our life is taken up by what other people are doing to us, are, are saying to us, and the, and the anxiety and the stress that causes. And life is too short to let that happen. So that's my biggest message, my biggest takeaway is that, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people say this about life, you know, you don't, you don't regret the things you did, you regret the things you didn't do. And so what I've got is this gift of this glimpse into my ending where a lot of us don't get that. A lot of us just kind of keep drifting through life until it comes to the end and we, we get sick and we die uh, or we're we in an accident and we die where I've got this little window where I can say, okay, let me focus. Let me focus on what's important. And so that's kind of what I'm, that's what I, I would wish people would take away from that. Um, it's an, it's an interesting thing to, to ponder because like if I try to put myself in those shoes and, and today I get a diagnosis that I have X amount of time left to live and there's probably not much else I can do about it. I, I wonder what things about my life would change because I'm pretty sure that I'd not, I would not stop doing the show. It would seem to me, given who I am and what I like to do, this is not only something that I, I should continue to do. You'd probably do one every day. But, yeah. We, You'd ramp it up. I might. That's what I'm thinking. You, there might be an atheist experience every day until the day every that I'm done. Every fucking day. Uh, because and I was, the one that's kind of what I did. The, I was living the life I'm living now, but I'm just, it's ramped up. It's on steroids. I'm in a hurry now. It's like, I've, it's like I was driving down the road, and all of a sudden, okay, shit, yeah, here we go. This is different. I wasn't counting on this. And I just mashed the accelerator down. That's basically the best way to put it, yeah. Have, have you gone out and done anything? Um, so one of the things, when I hear somebody talking about, you know, oh, I started giving stuff away and I sold stuff, um, it's a little different once you've actually received a diagnosis than if, if there's something else. Like if I had a friend who I didn't know what was going on and they started giving their stuff away, I would be reaching out to them saying, hey, is everything okay? Because that, that is emblemic of... of or emblematic of, of somebody who's pondering mm -hmm. their own demise. Right. You're in that situation wh where it's a regular thing. Have you gone out and done anything, uh, like did you go skydiving or, or anything risky, or was it like, more about the interpersonal stuff for you? It's more about the interpersonal stuff. I, I don't really, um, I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I'm more of a, um, I get off more on connecting. And I, I mean, I've made trips. I went to Italy just last month, but I was planning that trip anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I've, I've thought, and, and originally I thought, you know, I'm going to go, I thought, you know, hell, I'll just, I'll get 20 credit cards and max the fuck out of them and then just travel all over the world and then, you know, jump off uh, and uh, skydive and not open the parachute, you know, just, yeah. uh, those were just fan fantasy thinking. But, um, but no, I, but, I, I do want to I think travel. that's important. Because one of the things that happens when people find their way into religion is that a good chunk of them fall into this pit of nihilism, that the universe doesn't care about you, that there's no meaning or purpose to life, mm -hmm. that there's nothing to value, and why not end it all? And here you are in this position where you are faced with an end, and you are doing the exact opposite of what people fear anyone without a god might do. You are, you've, you've hit your accelerator, and you are living your life as fully and completely as you can. Mm -hmm. And originally my thought was... Um, I'll just go and do the stuff I want to do, see the places I want to see until I can't travel anymore because the way this disease progresses, you lose the ability to do things gradually. And so travel becomes more problematic as time goes by. Uh, but it shifted in the last few months, Matt, because basically when I started doing the podcast and um, t speaking and doing stuff like this, I started seeing how how much of an impact I was starting to make on people. And it, I'll get choked up thinking about it because I've gotten responses and messages and emails and and just uh, it's kind of blown me away to be honest because I wasn't expecting this and so it's kind of shifted my thinking into more of a 
from from this thing of just do all the stuff you want to do, Dave. Go go everywhere you want to do. Do anything you want to do. Nothing's off limits to what can I do that makes more of a difference? How can I spend, how can I maximize my time so that the time I'm spending and the places I'm going matter more? Because I really, I'm running out of time to make a mark and I want to I wanna make that mark because I've got that opportunity that's been handed to me and, and I don't want to, I don't want to waste that. It's, it's to me an incredibly important message because I can't count the number of times over the years somebody has called in and said, you know, oh, well, if I didn't believe in a God, I would run around and rape and pillage and rob and do all these things. The truth is when you're engaged in a sort of hypothetical exercise of what would I do with my life if this happened, you don't know. Mm-mm. You don't know until you're in that position, and no two people are necessarily going to react the same. And the things that you thought might have mattered to you can fundamentally change. They will. And, and it doesn't just have to be, um, you, you know, with a, a terminal or, or life-threatening diagnosis. Um, there were things, like, I, I've been open about the fact that uh, my divorce with Beth isn't final. We're still good friends. We still talk all the time. I still love Beth. Uh, we just aren't, aren't working together. Right. But once I realized that my marriage was over... The way I thought my life would be, what I feared would happen, and the person that I feared I would be, none of those things came. As a matter of fact, there were some fundamental changes where I was like, oh, hang on, I've been kind of thinking about this in a way that's not all that productive. Maybe there's a better way. And at no point would I ever suggest to anybody that the way I went about handling things or changing things is the right way or that whatever conclusion I end up reaching is the right thing except that it's the right thing for me. Yeah, you just do what you do. And I've had people say, you know, I, how are you being so brave? And, you know, I wouldn't be able to do that if, if it happened to me. And I say to them, you probably would. You'd probably do way better than you think you would. Uh, most of us sell ourselves short. I think that's common, common for, for humanity because, especially those of us steeped in religion, because you're told how bad you are from an early age. And even though you're, you, you change your mind about that, it's, it's so... It's so impressed upon you that there's remnants of that in our in our DNA, if probably. One one of the things is that this is this is a lot fear driven. Yeah. Our suspicions about what we do is based on our fears, and our fears are the result of the baggage we have. How many times have you looked at somebody else and been like, "Wow, I could not live like that." Exactly. Um, and as it turns out, that's you trying to put yourself in their position. Um, but your life is different. Exactly. And so I think most people will would respond better than they thought they would. And there, there's, I, I don't consider anything I'm doing noble or brave or inspirational or anything. It's just me doing what just came instinctual well, to me. Well, you're fucking wrong. Well, I don't Because agree. it's definitely inspirational. Uh, well, I'm hearing that it is, and that moves me, and it, it overwhelms me and humbles me, but it's not like I'm thinking, wow, look at me. Yeah. It's just that it was my instinct to do it. I That's what's inspirational about uh, it. If people got the impression that, you know, oh, what I want to do is... Uh, in my last remaining years, let's see if I can get famous for doing something mm-hmm. or let's see if I can get attention for doing something. It's, it's very clear to anybody who's spent 10 seconds with you. Uh, y- you have wrestled with stuff and came to grips with it and you, you portray it as if it was almost easy. I don't mean to... I, I, I mean, I got to tell you, dude, I have some really bad days. Yeah. I mean, I wake up and I just think, because my arms aren't working like they should and I look at my arms and they're... There's no muscle there, and I think, you're a fraud, you know? You're just, who do you think you are talking to anybody about anything? So I don't want to come across like I've got this shit figured out. No. What, when, I, when I say you talk about it as if it's easy, is that you, you, you've alternated between, hey, you've made your peace with it, and this is the way you're, you're going to live your life, and this is what's important, and yet it's, I don't know, I, I would think that, it, I would hope that it would be obvious to everybody that, it's difficult to have those sorts of epiphanies and talk to people about it and not have it be immediately obvious that now you're looking, for lack of a better word, sincerely into the core of who somebody is. Mm-hmm. And that, that prompts the rest of us with fears about our own stuff. The same fears where like, oh, I couldn't live life like that. It's those fears of, you know, do what I have the strength to do, what Dave's doing. What I, what I, what it, could I sit there and be as comfortable with it? And the truth is, um, we really don't know. We don't know <laughs> until we get there. And all of us, are, uh, 
all of us want to look like we've figured this out. Like we're going to mask some pain because we're not trying to put it on other people. Right, right, right. And what you're doing through the process of talking to, uh, about this stuff is giving people a look into not just life as an atheist, not just life as a non-believer, not just life as a former pastor, not just as life with uh, as someone with a terminal diagnosis. When, when I when I watch you and listen to you, I'm like, this is life and it's under horrific circumstances, and yet it's beautiful. It, it, is, it is a beautiful thing to, to watch someone, and, and I wouldn't want anybody to think that, oh, eh, you know, Dave's shrugging all this off like it's easy. It, it is not. Mm -mm. You, you, you have come to an understanding that few people are likely to, to have the opportunity, uh, and no matter how bad it is. I don't want to make it sound like, oh, you were given this grand gift. No, you got fucked yeah. by the universe. Yeah, and I get, I'm pissed about it many yeah. times. Oftentimes I'm pissed about it. I'm sad. I alternate between sad and, yeah, I have my self-pity and, and I'm pissed because I was living my best life and I fucking love life. And I, I, um, I didn't want I didn't want to leave the party early, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, that, that pisses me off. I tell you what, why don't we, um, why don't you pick out some callers here? We'll, uh, Oh, man. We'll I see what they want to talk about and see if anybody has uh, questions for you as well. Um, probably. You pick, Matt. I don't know. All right. We'll start with Je <coughs> Jeff in Florida. You're on with Dave Warnock and Matt Delonte. Oh, hello. Oh, good evening. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, hi. Hi, Dave. Yeah, sorry to hear about what you're going through. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I kind of missed the... Well, before I get my, my question, if I can ask Dave a question. Sure. Is it okay? You bet. Uh, so basically, I, I kind of missed the beginning of what the conversation was, but you're, you're saying you you don't believe in God anymore because you have an incurable disease? No. No, categorically no. Yeah, you just... That you, couldn't be as far from... Yeah, you, yeah. Missed a, you missed an important part of everything here. Um, I yeah. quit believing in God about eight years ago after a long and arduous process of discovery and examination and, and thought and, and questioning and, and came to a painful conclusion that the faith that I'd given myself to for 35 plus years was not true. So that, that happened many years ago. Um, I'd settle into uh, my understanding, my worldview as an atheist, and I've been living that way for quite some time. It was only this year, uh, the beginning of this year, February of this year that I found out I had ALS, a terminal illness. Oh. So the two are not related oh, so what, whatsoever. Oh, so what, what was the main conclusion that you came to that um, the, your faith was wrong? I began to see that uh, after a, a long period of time of looking and wondering and things that didn't add up and questions that didn't have answers and a God that never showed up and a God that was silent and a God that was hiding, um, I realized that the God that I thought was there all my life has not been there, is not there, and has never been there. And essentially, I ran out of reasons to believe and um, uh -oh. saw no evidence to suggest that there's a God actively involved with humanity on any level. Oh, uh, like, like God was silent. That's no, he's not there. Like, uh, like, like the, well, like the Bible says, you, you would have prayers, but they would like just hit the ceiling, and there's nothing, nobody there. The Bible says prayers hit the ceiling? I don't remember that verse. It really doesn't. Um, it says, whatever you pray yeah. for, believe it, you receive it, and you shall have it. That's what it says. It says, wherever two or more you're well, gathered in my name, whatever you ask for, mm -hmm. you will receive, which means no two, no two true believers have ever prayed for world peace yeah. or an end to hunger or anything. Yeah. The Bible promises, well, no, was, the yeah, Bible was, promises yeah. over and over again answers to prayers, and yet the human experience yeah. indicates that those prayers are never answered, and that then we make excuses for that by saying, well, God says no, or not wait. yet, or yeah. wait, or I'm testing you, or you don't have enough faith, or blah, 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 blah. blah. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, there, there, is a lament, there is a lamenter whose, whose, whose prayers uh, felt like they were hitting the ceiling, this was, was his feeling. Ah. So what, what, were, you, were, you, were you in the Word of Faith movement? Uh, there was a short period of time, my early Christian experience, that the Word of Faith was a big influence. The Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Charles Capps, all those guys, yeah. um, name it, claim it, believe it, receive it, those kind of things, which didn't happen either. Yeah, I, I've, 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 been, I've been kicked out of uh, my last church. I got kicked out because they were, they were heading into the Word of Faith movement. And I, I told the pastor, I said, you know, you're going to answer to God one day because when these people find out this crap doesn't work, you're going to answer to God because they're going to walk away from God. 
Yeah. Um, Except that we don't have any evidence that they will ever answer to a God. Mm -mm. Well, I know that's... You know, and by the way, in my, my and by the way, this this sort of doctrinal dispute that you're talking about, where you have a fundamental disagreement, it's the reason there's over a thousand denominations that all identify as Christian that disagree on everything, and they all think they're right. And they, yeah, and here's the thing: while you are confident that your view of this is different from the pastor that you were chastising and calling out, um, where's your God? A hundred others would have would have disagreed with your position and would have cast you out for a different reason. I mean, so. if, if God has an opinion about which denomination has actually got doctrine right, why doesn't he say so? Well, my, my, uh, my opinion is, is based on uh, proper hermeneutical principles. Well, how do you... And, okay, stop. How, first of all, saying the proper hermeneutical principles uh, is already mildly dishonest in the sense that you don't just, like, that's like saying, hey, I've concluded there is no God and it's properly logical of me to do so. Well, no, no, there, there are, are proper principles for uh, interpreting any, any literature. I mean, if you're going to yeah, be Yeah, but your view of what's you, proper you have... is going to be different than someone else's view of what's proper. The word of faith guy no. is going to is going to con conflict with the no, with the not, Calvinist. Not only that, no, no, not, only, not only that, but at the end of the day, we're talking about, here's the Bible, and you're talking about how to correctly interpret How to the rightly Bible. divide the word of truth. All right, let, let me give you an example. How can Kenneth you prove Hagen, that your interpretation is correct? All right, let me give you an example with, with Kenneth Hagin. His One of his main uh, teachings is uh, where Jesus says, have faith in God. Yeah, so now you're uh, approaching a Tuco K. fallacy. I don't care what he said. No. I'm asking you about how no, do you know that you're right? Hermeneutical. I'm talking about a hermit. When, you, when you're interpreting the Bible, you have to interpret what the Bible actually says. No, I no. actually don't. But no. see, this is this is the problem. There's two big problems here, Jeff. Um, interpretation is, by definition, imbuing some understanding. Doesn't matter if you're using whatever you would call proper hermeneutic principles or not. The other thing is, even if you got to a correct understanding of what the person originally wrote, despite the fact that you don't have originals, you don't know who that person is, even if you got to that, that doesn't tell you not anything at all about whether they were correct in what they wrote. Jeff, here's the deal about the Bible. If, if that's God's instruction book to us, and, he, and it was that important for him to communicate to us, and 2,000 years later, we're still arguing about what it means, couldn't he have done a little better job of communicating to his people? I mean, seriously. We're arguing about that 2,000 years later. And the Christians can't even get it right. You guys argue about it among yourselves. God has done a really, really poor job of communicating the life-changing message to humanity, the message that all of life depends upon for eternal salvation, and God couldn't communicate it any better than that. Well, it, it sounds like to me that you two are arguing for a reader-based interpretation. And no, 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 no. Oh, you mean no? I just got done saying that even if you correctly understood the author's original intent, that is independent of whether or not they were correct in what they were saying. Right. If the author's original intent was that Jesus is part of a trinity and divine, that doesn't tell you whether or not that's true. That just tells you what that person intended to convey. I'm talking about oh. not a reader interpretation. I'm talking about throw hermeneutics out the fucking window and let's talk about epistemology. Let's talk about whether or not we have good reason to believe that something is true. And what's happened here is that you've been convinced because you already believed that there is some method by which you can get to a correct understanding. Where is your God to vouchsafe for your particular understanding of the Bible? No, it's just, it's just basic literary interpretation skills. I mean, you, you learn it in third grade, fourth grade. Uh, you know, it's... It's we, like we're we, speaking we two to, different languages. Yeah, we are. Why is it you can't answer the question that I put to you? We are speaking two different languages. Where is your God to let me know that you are correct in your interpretation? Well, I'm not... I'm not here to say, where is my, my God? I'm just, I'm just talking about when you're reading the Bible... It doesn't say the things that the Word of Faith teachers were telling. I we're don't give a rat's ass about teachers. the Word of Faith. You brought that up, and I, th I suspected the instant you brought it up is that you are desperately looking for a way to say that he didn't have the right faith, but you do. And I almost called you out on it then, but every word you've said <laughs> since then has demonstrated that I was correct. No, no, what I'm saying is that what he was told 
was not true. Oh, I know. We're not. I was. Can I? Yes, please. <laughs> I wondered how long it would take for him to do that. <laughs> to come back and say, no, no, no. My point was that what he was told wasn't true. Yes, your point is that the word of faith teaching he had wasn't the true gospel and that you have it. And over and over again, we asked you to demonstrate how anybody uh. else could fucking know that. And you just keep going back and dancing around it. You wanted to, wanted it wanted us to think, well, just like everybody else has done, I've done this show for 15 years, the number of people who would say, hey, oh, you were a Baptist? Oh, that's you got it you, wrong. You weren't part of the right... Let me show you the right yeah, way. You weren't, yeah. you weren't the right type of Protestant, mm -hmm. or you weren't a Catholic, or whatever else, which is why when Jen is on the show, you've got an ex-Catholic and an ex-Baptist, and it's, okay, you're going to tell us we both had the wrong one? Which one's the right one? How could we possibly know? Well, is you need a, Jehovah's a, Witnesses? a charismatic thing. You need a Pentecostal. Yeah. Pentecostal. That's you what Jerry DeWitt would tongues, say. Right. Yeah. That's right. My buddy Jerry. Yeah. Well, you weren't Pentecostal. You, didn't have, you didn't have the full gospel, brother. That's right. Oh, boy. You can make up those excuses all you want. Oh, boy. My, my position is not, you are in fact wrong when you make this claim. It is, how on earth could you possibly show that you're right? Right. Where, where is God? If, if you think about this, it, would a God inspire words to be written down in languages that he knows is going to die out and change? I don't know, I don't know how God couldn't know that. Because uh, I'm just a mere human being, and I know that English is going to die out and change at some point in the future. And, w and even if these clips survive on YouTube, they're going to need some kind of translator, and they're probably going to get shit that I said wrong. So in a thousand years, friends, if you are able to translate my English in a thousand years, do not trust the translation. That's a boneheaded thing to do. Boneheaded is a way of saying irrational, unrealistic, illogical. illogical, not just that you have, it's that maybe your brain isn't functioning or is solidified at that point. Uh, not literally, but metaphorically. And oh crap, how are they going to translate metaphors? Mm. Parables. It's weird. It's these people wholeheartedly, and you and I both believe this as well. Oh yeah, I taught the Bible God for years. God conveyed this. This is mm -hmm. God's instruction book for all of us. It never occurred to me what a poor job he did. I mean, until I got on this side of it and looked back and say, okay, if Jesus really walked around thinking that what he was saying was going to be used as, as words to live by, instructions for life and death, serious shit, really important stuff. Can we have somebody take some notes yeah. anywhere? Really? There's that meme of, hey, somebody write this down because I don't want four different versions what of the this. Hell? You know? Or maybe wait a few years until there's a recorder available. Well, you mentioned during Talk Heathen that you, know, you look at the Ten Commandments and you got prohibitions against graven images but not slavery. Yeah. And if you read really? through the rest of the 613 uh, of the... Still not in there. Hey, why are we so concerned about shellfish and pork? <laughs> And mixed, hey, why are we going mix, mixed fabrics? You know, don't wear that poly but cotton blend. I'm going to give you some instruction on how to beat your slave. Yeah. Right. No. That's hey, just wrong. And you're my chosen people. I'd like you to go over and slaughter that entire mm -hmm. village down the road. But even the keep children. All the, keep, even the children, but keep the virgin girls for yourself. And you want to talk to me about morality? I don't think so. Yeah. That dog don't. Well, we're getting riled up, aren't we? We are, but we got Kyle in Canada who's been patiently waiting. You're on with Dave and Matt. Hi, Dave and Matt. How are you guys doing today? Hey, Kyle. We're we're okay ish, ish. Oh, oh good to hear. Right. First time to be on the the line with you, Matt. I've been watching you for years, and you're, you're sorry. Quite the guy to to listen to. I I, I uh, respect your mindset quite a bit there. So it's it's an honor to speak to you for once. Probably don't have well, time here. I do appreciate it, but let's not waste yep. Dave's time. Uh, I'm dying. Okay. We got questions or, or, or discussions with Dave today. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I appreciate Dave's uh, point of view about life there. It is uh, something that is, I think, we. it would be quite nice if more people had that mindset instead of uh, holding back, right? So. Thanks. What's your question? It'd be very nice if people could get that sort of mindset without the consequences that come along with it. Yeah, right. Yes, for sure. And uh, I, I, I'm going to do my Canadian duty and apologize in advance. For... Of course. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. So what, I so, so what I wanted to discuss there is uh, the, the thought of could reducing the, the religion's division increase uh, humanism in this day and age, 2019. Not sure I understood the question. Did you? Yeah, I'm not sure I understood the question. 
Could religion's division... Could reducing religion increase humanism? Yeah. I mean, reducing, <laughs> reducing religion is a really good idea. I'm with you there, Kyle. I, it, it's, so you could reduce religion without actually increasing humanism, but I think most likely there would be more people who are humanists since people find their way out of religion and adopt humanism on a regular basis. Yeah, so it, that's my hope for the future kind of thing. So that's what I Yeah, kind of my question. view on religion is that it's very divisive by nature because religions all set themselves over against one another. And my thought on that is all the religions can't be right, but they all can be wrong. And so reducing religion as a whole, I think, would cause us to relate with one another as humans rather than me saying, well, my position on, on my worldview and my religion is right and yours is wrong, and that's where we have all this division. So if you take religion off the table and just deal with one another as human beings, all doing the best we can to get through life, then, yeah, I think you're going to have less division by nature. One of the things, though, is that it, like, if you took the tenets of secular humanism, pull up I don't know, any one of the secular humanist manifestos. I have objections to what's in each one of them, but I largely agree uh, with most of them. I have yet to find a religion that offers anything that could be viewed as equal to or superior to humanism when it comes to practically, realistically evaluating reality and trying to make a better world. Mm -hmm. it, if, there yeah. were, if there were one, I would certainly be interested to know how you can demonstrate that this is going to lead to a better world than or at least has better principles than a humanist one does. And as long as well, that's the case, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, my, my thing is, is, like, it's 19 years after the new millennium, and it's the possibility that religion is a 20th century man-made construct. That no, because it's way fucking older than that. Yeah, yeah, but it lived in the 20th century. And the 19th and the 18th and the 17th and the 16th and the 15th and the 14th and the 13th and the 12th, the 11th, 10th, 9th, 8th, 7th, 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd, 2nd, 1st. We can go BC if you want to. Religion's been around with us ever since people looked around the world and said, wow, I wish I understood it, but I don't, so I'll make some shit up. Right. But it's 2019 years since what? Since nothing. Since an arbitrary date on a calendar. Since. Oh, okay, my answer yeah. is. After Christ and before Christ, or so we kind of yeah. No, uh, so first of all, there would you you would need to demonstrate this. Now, traditionally, yes, we broke it down into BC and AD, but the modern dating methods are CE and BCE, and that's for common era because it's ridiculous for the entire world to center its calendar around a religious figure who may or may not have existed and certainly isn't, a, a, no, not everybody on the planet is beholden to or owes that. That basically shows you which, which religious group kind of got power. Mm -hmm. True, it's still, we've been debating about it for 2019 years. Actually, no. Around no, because that. Jesus didn't, if Jesus existed and died, that was around 30-something CE, not zero. Okay, I stand corrected here. Just... I'm just, I'm, I'm pointing this out not to be snarky, but because the, the fact that a bunch of people believe something and in part based a calendar on it um, is, mm -hmm. is no more relevant to the truth of it than the Mayan calendar that predicted the world was going to end a decade ago. Okay, I, I may have misspoke Seven about generalizing to that one one time frame there, but my point but, was that it is something of the past that could have been outlived. We, we could could learn something from those all those years and all the hard lessons, and and do something that's equal and opposite that generally equals out to humanism so, without religion. So you're making a couple of presumptions there. And, and, and you're doing it in a way that is not as annoying to me as when other people have done exactly the same thing. So congrats. Because what some people will say is, oh, I don't need religion, but these other people do. Like right. they wouldn't know how to behave or act if they didn't have my holy book to tell them. And what you're suggesting is that, well, maybe for nearly 2,000 years, we needed that to give us answers or guidance or instruct our lives, but maybe we don't need it anymore. And at the end of the day, all I care about is, is it true? Mm -hmm. Do I have any good reason to believe that it's true? And by and large, um, non-theism and humanism have been around for a long, long, long time in a variety of different forms. From the, from every, since the beginning when people po were positing gods, there was somebody sitting on the sideline or vocally proudly saying, yeah, I think you're full of it. 
And at no point, it, it's it's incredibly arrogant to think that I don't need something. But you do. But you do. Or someone else Even did. if it were true. Or saying that these ignorant people from generations before, because they didn't have science, needed religion to help them get through. Well, that's just, you know, I, religion, again, has caused so much damage and done so much, so much, has caused so much pain and suffering in the world. I mean, I, you think about uh, when people have, have argued that the God who practiced genocide in the Old Testament has matured and gotten kinder over, over time. Yeah. You've heard that, right? Jesus kind of told Dad, to, hey, calm down, man. Um, you know, let's be nice and let's love one another and be hippies. And so, but this God in the past just had to do that because that's how he rolled. Well, it's too bad for the little baby in Canaan, the Canaanite baby who got slaughtered on some random genocide. That kid didn't get to grow up and have a full life. But you know what? That's what had to happen back then because God was pissed off all the time. Yeah. And those people needed religion. No, it's bullshit. It's not true. It's not right. It's not helpful. Like and if we'd have had a humanism or anything close to that around that time, uh, I think I think if if humanism and the principles behind um, modern secular ethics had been available in the past, religions would have gone away a long time Ex- ago. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, as soon as you realize that, oh, wait, your God w- wants everybody to hate me because I had sex with another dude uh, and yet the two of us were consenting and had fun and didn't affect anybody else in any way uh, it doesn't really take a lot of thought. how many how many anti-gay politicians have completely flipped the second they find out their their beloved niece or nephew mm-hmm. is part of the LGBT community now it's personal oh well, maybe maybe God's okay with it. Maybe I can do the love the sin or hate the sin. How about you stop thinking of it as sin and just recognize that we're human beings exactly. and we're doing stuff and maybe it's none of your fucking business who we're sleeping with. Well, God's always been Not you necessarily, like Kyle. I don't yeah. mean to put words in your mouth, but... <laughs> I hear what you're saying there. Um, and and uh, it, it's my, my thought there that, like, if... Uh, in the past, atheism wasn't so so prominent, and this day and age, it is becoming an emergent thing because of the the grievances of, of the texts and the past actions of all past. Uh, that and and today, this day and age, the the atheist community is emerging because uh, we we're trying to rely on science, logic, and reason, and and we we have those tools of of science and knowledge at our disposal that I'd recommend past, I'd recommend you, you are you familiar with Colonel Ingersoll no I'm not you absolutely should be so just google Robert Green Ingersoll um, because this is somebody at the end of the 19th century so well over 120 years ago mm-hmm. um who was known as the great agnostic, who would write dissertations in newspapers, spoke at the Republican National Convention, had p- plenty of debates with preachers and everything else. Something really problematic happened at the end of the 19th century, um, at the end of this kind of um, new enlightenment with you know the, the advent of science and scientific knowledge and everything else. And that was a group of elitists figured out that religion isn't supported. No, no religion has a sound epistemological foundation to where you believe it's true. But they decided that talking about religion or politics was uh, something that was beneath us and let, let the little people keep their religion. And so you went from an era where there was plenty of talking conversation about morality from a secular perspective, about the world from a secular perspective, and that stopped and backfired to the point where in 1954-ish, uh, when you're in the McCarthy era and you have the, the godless Russians as the uh, mm-hmm. communists as the enemy, that's when we have and In God, God We, we Trust, trust yep. added as the new national logo. We changed our national logo in the, in the 1950s and then made sure that it was put on every bit of coin. This is the advantage position that religions have managed to keep putting themselves into. So this new... There's no new atheism, but the, this newest rise in atheist popularity and discussion is partly about the internet. Absolutely. Partly about the fact that people are able to like, access knowledge, access information, but also I, I'm not on Fox or CNN or MSNBC. Uh, I'm not even on some shitty cable channel. 
we did this show public access for years, and now it's just an internet show. And yet I guarantee you there are more people watching the show than some of the stuff that's actually on TV. Because you can make money off of having, you know, 50,000 viewers a week for your crappy little show on your crappy little network. But we've, we're in a, in a world where people are now more free to talk about this, right. at least in the West and in, in the U.S. Um, you talk about, I had a caller that I took after the show last week who's an ex-Muslim living in Paris. And we ended up talking with some other ex-Muslims, including people whose lives were in danger when they were in Bangladesh, uh, merely for talking about the fact that they don't believe. So I'm incredibly fortunate, privileged, whatever label you want to put on it, nobody can fucking shut me up. Mm -hmm. That's the big difference. Okay. Religions were in a position where for years they could shut you up, that people were run out of town. You get to a town, what's the first, you, you move. People are like, hey, what, what church do you go to? Why don't you come to our church? Right. Are you going to say, no, I don't go to church, I don't believe in that stuff? Because now you are at odds with all of your neighbors from the get-go, so despite just, the fact you could be a wonderful person. So you'll just be quiet about it. So yeah. it's, it's also there are more of them, more atheists that are, that are being formed, if you will, or coming to the end of their faith if they ever had one. But mostly I think it's because they're, they're being louder about it. They're speaking out, it, like you said. It's more comfortable in the sense that if I'm the only atheist I've ever met and ever known, I'm now the outsider. Right. I have to be quiet around my family. I'm the one that's odd. I'm the one that's I'm being gaslit left and right. About and that still happens else. a lot. And now we're, we're getting to a point where there's less of that, where if you find yourself no longer believing, there are communities like this one. Mm -hmm. We're open, ACA building's open seven days a week from 11 to 9. There's something going on here all the time. Yes, Sunday is, of course, our busiest day because we're doing this show and talk heathen and the other Lord's stuff. Work. Uh, yeah, we're doing uh, the Lord's work, on the, Lord's the Lord day. of reason. <laughs> Anyway, so, uh, I, I don't want to talk over you all day. What's up? Yeah, so um, is it a fair statement to say that uh, religion of the past was kind of a, a, a search for a certain experience or existence that we never arrived to? That's why we're still debating about it. I think religion was formed, as, as Matt said, to explain things that men didn't understand and to try to find answers for things that they didn't have answers to. There's lightning in the sky. It must be a god of lightning, and let's find a virgin to feed it so it doesn't hurt us. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that's how religion was formed, to try to explain the unexplainable. And as more and more science explains things that we didn't have answers for before, uh, I think fewer and fewer people are needing to rely upon religion to give them those answers. I, I think one of the things is also kind of telling is that we're speaking about religion in broad terms, and yeah. re religions are very they're different and yet similar in many ways. But I think that if you pick a church, at, pick a Christian church at random and have any random church member write down what they doctrinally believe and what is, uh, mm -hmm. and include some things on what is morally correct and what's morally incorrect. Compare that, if you could, which you can't, to what somebody wrote 150 years ago mm -hmm. from that same denomination. It will not be the same. No, it's evolving always. There, there are probably some exceptions. Some ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Judaism may have, may have stagnated so much that it is almost without change. But by and large, I mean, I remember when I was a kid in the 70s, I would occasionally hear somebody talk about the outfit that somebody wore to church and how that was inappropriate for church. That, you know, you put on your Sunday best. You put on, you know, you wore a, a sport coat, you wore a tie if you could, you dressed up nice, you did all these things. Now you've got mega churches where people are showing up in sandals and shorts and t-shirts, including t-shirts. Yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, and they're the ones on the stage. Um, Sorry, but then you have running. you have uh, women wearing short dresses, causing those men to laugh. Causing mm -hmm. those men to, that would have like if you'd have showed up in church when in in 1974 when I walked down the aisle to accept Jesus in my heart, and you had a little mini skirt on, even though mini skirts were still a thing. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, you'd have been shunned. Well, mm -hmm. you in particular, because I think that if you were wearing a miniskirt, that might actually be slightly more shocking, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to make presumptions about no, what people wear. Never. But I, I want to shoot something towards you here. Yeah, sure. Um, my, my curiosity or thought, where I'm kind of going towards there, is that uh, humanism, to circle back to that, has a certain experience or existence that I, I haven't experienced myself, and I don't really know exactly what that is, but it's different than a religious existence. And yeah. or experience in ways, and and um, the the religions have their their uh, 
the, the motivating factors to join and stay in them. And I think uh, there's some experiences and some aspects of existence that a humanist lifestyle or way of thinking or or connection with each other is better than a religious living connection you, you've so, you've hit on, you've you've kind of hit around an incredibly point, important point religions have been in a privileged position they had tax free status they were the de facto thing you know everybody was assumed to be religious or treated as if they were religious or a part of your religion uh, such that that being the atheist, being the secularist is, is something that would kind of put you on the outside of things. Mm-hmm. And because of that, s- modern secular communities are, are starting the race much later. And so we're, we are not as good yet at building communities. We are not as good yet at raising money because we don't, we don't have some divine motivation that you need to give us 10 or 20 percent of your income. Uh, and also a lot of people are finding their way out of religions and, and they are giving up on community as well. Yeah. They don't want to come here because when they went to church on Sunday and they hung out with people, uh, there was a lot of BS thrown at them. and maybe, a lot, It was an agenda. And then you, you, pass, you pass the offering plate, and you're, so you're being asked for money. Well, we have food up here at the building. Uh, it's free. Religion thrives on two things, guilt and fear. And you build, you, you, people come together around those two things because they're afraid if they don't, um, acquiesce to their God, then there's there's a punishment, there's a consequence that they're afraid of, and then guilt for the the message being thrown at you from birth that you're that you're wrong, that you're broken, that you are in need of a savior. When you take those two elements out, all you've got is community. And so, as Matt was saying, there there's the we're we're behind we're behind the curve on building community, but it is happening, and, and we're, we're like up. in Nashville, we're building an, an incredible community of ex-Christian atheists, and it's built around our common love for one another, our commonality as human beings, and that's really all you need. We don't, we don't uh, manipulate people through guilt or fear or any kind of thing where, where if you don't come, we have meetings every month, and we just say, here's what we're doing, and there's nobody calling you next month and say, we sure didn't see you last month. What's wrong? Are you okay? Which I'm not necessarily opposed to. Well, but it's all guilt. It's all guilt laden, you know. And it, it, it can be. Yeah. If you if you're doing it as if oh there was an no, expectation. Care, yeah, but if you're concerned about so, it. Hey, right, I missed right. you. Right. Yeah, I missed you, man. Uh, love to hang out. But the the community aspect is what every every ex Christian I've talked to has said. The thing they they miss about church. The only thing they miss about church was community, and and being connected to other people with, around a commonality. And so uh, I, I talk to ex-Christians all the time who've deconverted, and many of them are isolated and don't have community. They live in communities where they're the only ones they know of who's had this experience, and they, it's very disorienting and very lonely. And so, uh, again, the Internet helps us to stay connected. It's not the same as hugging a neck and looking face-to-face and those kind of things. So community is being built, but it's being built around our common humanity, which is truly all we need. Yes, and and uh, my thing is is to try to, and, and uh, I don't have better words for it, but to kind of take the wind out of the sails of religions that people stand behind by by coming together and and, and experiencing those those more humanistic uh, uh, things there that we need to to do today, because I don't necessarily uh, believe in, in what I call external supernatural salvation to like, I don't believe yeah. that God come solve my problems for me. I think they're, they're of my own kind of thing there. So mm-hmm. to prove the people that do believe in external supernatural salvation, that you don't no savior is required by coming together and, and showing them that just, just come with us and be human. And, and, and that will kind of end the war because the, the battle between what, what is the, uh, it's not engaging in the battle. Yeah, I, I don't want to quite go to pie in the sky stuff because while I think people on average are generally good and would generally go, there's still going to be individuals who are horribly broken and sure, and what we're we, humans, what we, we make we, mistakes. But my my question, my curiosity for you, go Kyle, is it, so the the call screener thing lists you as a theist. Sounds like one of us. And and yet, yeah. I, in what way are you a theist? Well, I I do believe in my own way. I hold some pretty harsh views on religion, so I I, I can't really say I'm, I'm 
religious there. And, and yeah, but you, you just said something about not believing in any sort of external supernatural. So what's God to you? Uh, it, it, I, 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 I don't really uh, rely on, on uh, uh, to, to God, to me, like I, my self direction comes to trying to embody my my full potential, which is my is a, it's a subjective thing. It's not of God. It's of Sounds myself. Sounds like you're a humanist. Expression, and so I'm just trying to express myself to to learn more and, and get to that potential that, that if I were just to hold it in, I'd never get to. Yeah, you just so. did, you just did something that's intriguing because quite a few people would, would look at us and say, oh, you guys are humanists. That means you've made yourself God. And I used to I used to be like, no, 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 that's not what that means. And now I'm like, yeah, fuck it, I'm God. Yeah, sure, why like, not? Wh whatever. Uh, if I'm there's okay gotta with be a that. God, I'll be him. Because, yeah, what I've done is the thing that, you, that, uh, that a theist would worship as um, the guiding governance of the universe, I don't think that exists. And so they look at you and they say, but Matt, you revere logic and reason and evidence and, and humanity and freedom and these sorts of things that you have. And that is your God, Matt. And I'm like, okay, if that's all you think, um, if your God is nothing more than the collection of things that you prefer, then telling me that I've made myself God is no different from admitting that you did exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean you specifically, Kyle, but when, when you talk about this, yeah, it just means if, if I'm the one that's guiding my life and, and, and you think God guides your life, then yeah, I'm God because I'm guiding my life. But I don't worship myself. Yeah. I know myself too well and to do that. We, yes, that would be a huge mistake. <laughs> but but the, uh, the, the thing is, when we asked you about your God, you talked about you, realizing your full potential, doing what you thought was right, that, that sort of thing. And, and that yeah, is in and many ways that. humanism. Yeah, that's humanism. Yeah, I, that's that's why I identify more towards. But I I, I think uh, addressing the religion of the past will help us move into the future. Uh, oh, I agree. Yeah, it. we're good there. There's a reason I take calls from people who who still have the religions of the past. Thanks for the call, Kyle. Appreciate it. I appreciate your time, and you have a great day. Thanks, buddy. You actually said something earlier, uh, and I'm not going to get the phrasing right, but about living life as an atheist and doing the best that we can and then until you find better and how it's a Maya Angelou quote actually Maya yeah. Angelou do the best you can until you know better and then do better how simple is that and you know there's a reason she's revered I know right Maya Angelou it may be God oh my God uh, I certainly higher her. on the ladder yeah. than either of us yeah higher evolved anyway um you know, you and I both uh, were Christians and pastors and did. we thought we were doing the right thing. We really— I wasn't a pastor, but I'll—, well, I'll uh, close enough. Yeah, you're, you're a leader in church. And, you know, anyway, we thought we were doing the right thing. You know, we're doing it sincerely with our whole heart, and then we come to the conclusion uh, that, oh, that's not right. That's, I'm, and I reserve the right to change my mind any time along my lifespan that I want to. It's my fucking life, so I'll that's change right. it if I want to. And so I came to the, I looked at some stuff and I said, okay, I was wrong. I made a mistake. Now I'm going to do better. And this is me trying to do better. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I, I love the quote and, and everything behind it. Uh, let's grab, uh, well, we'll go with Charlie in Arkansas. So Ooh, this, Suey. Uh, whatever's going on there audio-wise, Charlie, you've got to cut it off. Uh, uh, there's nothing going on over here audio-wise. Oh, well, there, there was in our ear. Yes, we can hear ourselves, uh, but it sounds sounds, like you're banging. On I'm going to actually pan. put you back on hold. If uh, call screener can take a look at line three and maybe have Vern or somebody talk to him. Well, it uh, is Arkansas, so yeah. Having grown up there, I well, know. let's go all the way across a bigger pond, and we'll go over to the UK where Mark's waiting to talk to us. Hi there, Matt and Dave. How you doing? Hey, Mark. Hey. Hi. Um, I'm inspired. By what Dave said on his intro, that's kind of what I was going to address. But if you would indulge me for, for 20 seconds, I, I'd love to address uh, Matt and Dennis of a week or two ago on Darwin, if you don't mind. You'd like to address what? A week or so ago on um, Darwin, uh, I think he said. I, go ahead said with whatever you're going to say. We'll, we'll yeah. sort it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Darwin was, was accused of being a racist by your caller, and uh, oh, I was I'd accused like to... of being a racist, not Don. No, 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 Darwin. Not 
Oh, Darwin. Okay. I thought... Uh, Darwin, Darwin won. Yeah. So many calls, I, I, I clearly confused her. <laughs> and that's cool. Um, I live only sort of 20 minutes from Down House, which is, which is Darwin's house. Right. And he... Um, he was a man of his time, I'd like to say, in, in 20 seconds. He was a man of his time. He had issues of racism, I understand, but he was very anti-slavery. He used to have debates with Fitzroy, who was the captain of the Beagle, and caused him a load of problems. So, you know, he, he, he was a man of his time, but progressive, progressive as well. And it doesn't mean to say he... You know, evolution was wrong. He knew nothing of nuclear ties, DNA, that kind of thing. Then the theory is still sound. At the end of the day, just, Hitler could have come up with evolution, and it wouldn't change whether or not evolution by natural selection is the best model we have for understanding diversity. Mm -hmm. It's not the delivery person. Absolutely. And and Hitler went with eugenics because of evolution, yeah. distorted it. Yep. So what else did you have for us, Mark? So, yeah. Um, yeah, so basically... Um, I, I'm in my mid-40s now. I've been an atheist all my life. Um, I've had no issue with that. I've lost grandparents. I live in the UK. Um, according to a Catholic poll, 75% of um, people in the UK now are non-believers. And I've been totally fine with that until last year I lost my mother quite suddenly. And now it's given me a, a, a sort of a a block, an impasse of how I deal with death and mortality. I can't get my head around the, the oblivion. And since that moment, I'm in my mid-40s, I've gone for all kinds of health screening, sort of paranoia that I've got something, scans, heart tests, blah, blah, blah. And... Um, there's no way for me to rationalise sort of dealing with it. And I think as a, as a community, we need to, it's not easy, but to come up with some sort of way to project an alternative to what is comfortable, what religion gives as comfort to people. And I understand that. And I've looked into it further, but, you know, there, there's no way I'm going to believe it just because I kind of need something. Mm -hmm. Um, I like a bit of Sam Harris. He does a mindfulness um, Buddhist kind of thing. But, I mean, everyone I know is an atheist. And people around my age now are starting to lose parents. And then can't, I can't discuss it. I can't talk about it. And people I know of, even pets, have freaked out sure. and ashes. You know, it's... So um, essentially, uh, first of all, sorry about the loss of your mother, Mark. Um, you. You're basically talking about a fear of death because you you just don't know what's beyond it, and and um, well, I, I'm sort of quite certain that there's nothing beyond it. So it's right. the oblivion, loss of my mother who loved my daughter, right? Who loved her granddaughter, and suddenly it's all lost, and right. I'm. I'm just a, a block of, I. The grief is bad enough, but it's times two with. How do I deal with oblivion? I mean, I w I would add, I, I've watched you guys for like a year, and Matt has spoken about he's got a bit a bit of a relief of no hell stuff. So you're coming at it from that point of view. But well, not just that. Not, it's not just a relief that there's no hell. I'm relieved that sure. I have no reason to believe there's a heaven or a hell, and I find both yeah, I, empowering and, 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 and relieved. Yeah, I think that I yeah. think removing the notion of an afterlife helps us grasp the reality and the beauty of this life. Um, and, and that's a lot of what I'm focusing on when I'm talking about dying out loud and living out loud. It's just that this life is, I mean, I, I know that, I understand what you're saying about the the um, discomfort with the oblivion of of coming to the end yeah. of this, but to me yeah. it's 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 okay because it's the way things happen. It's the way that that the that life ends. We just we have a certain number of years. We don't know how many they're going to be, and rather than focusing on what comes beyond that and what we're losing when that's over, 
it's it's about focusing on what we have right in front of us, what we can get our hands on right now. And I, I, I'm sorry that you're dealing with the sadness of that, but I would, if, if the best I can, I would encourage you to, to try to, um, to try to find ways to get your mind around focusing and thinking on the moments that you have to live right now. Is what you're going through? I, I mean, you, you talked about can't get your head around oblivion. So it sounds like yeah. you're being tempted in, into notions of, um, not not specifically nihilism, but a- almost a fear of what it would be like to be dead. Um, yes, I've, I'm sort of preoccupied now. It's like a, an existential crisis. I'm mm. And, and that, to, that to me, and, and I'm not suggesting... Focusing, and I know it's massively unhealthy. And I know what you're saying and what Dave's saying is focus, make the most of. And I've... No, 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 no. I, I, I like... All my life. I, I like a quote that, that's attributed to Mark Twain that may or may not have been Mark Twain, um, which... T- to me, made it clear, but it doesn't work for everybody. And that is, I was dead for a billion years before I was born, and it never bothered me one bit. When 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 I hear people talking about being terrified of what it would be like to be dead, they're doing something we talked about earlier, which is playing a hypothetical in their head and then putting them as they are right now into that. But if you're dead, there is no you that is experiencing. You're not anything. even aware of it. It's it, it's like when if you say, "What's it like to be dead?" It's identical to not ever being born at that point. It's not I, like there's a person there. I understand there. that completely. Yeah. And I understand it completely. I'm completely on your side. You're just having a hard time getting way, your head around it. I understand, it, yeah. Just now that it's so in my face. I've lost grandparents before, right. but it's it's now so in my face because it's apparent that um, I, I've just been taken aback. You're by just in the, grieving. You're grieving. The waste and yeah. the oblivion, and there's nothing... To help me in in any way, I, I've been to the the GP in the UK, and and you get thrown a, a few drugs here and there, and there's mm-hmm. there, there's no kind of what do I do with this? So you were so, done, and you were done an incredible disservice. And it was while you've been an atheist your entire life, that disservice is firmly at the planet at the feet of religions, because. If we understood that death is an inevitable part of life, which we should all intuitively think, yeah. Yeah, and we grasped that properly. It would it would put us in a position where, where we are better equipped to deal with it when it occurs. But religions color Absolutely. the entire conversation Absolutely. about this, and it's like, oh, I'm going to live forever. Or, I'm going to see my mother again in paradise, or what, whatever the the thing is. And even if we don't believe it, even if it's if even if it's something that we never grasped onto, you are still living in a culture that portrays all these means. Mm-hmm. The, oh, it's, you know, heaven, even just in casual conversation, I was dating someone um, who I described as singing like an angel. Now, I don't believe in it's angels. It's in our Ain't language. Real? You know, Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. It's, yeah. in, it's in our language. It's in how we talk. It's in the words we use. So it's this subliminal subculture that we carry with us whether we realize it or not. I think Yeah, it exactly infuses right. everything. And I, I wish that we could also, let's just stick with Zeppelin and we go to something like Immigrant Song where we're talking about Thor, where we're talking about Asgard, where mm-hmm. we're talking about things like that. Nobody gets upset or traumatized that our loved ones aren't in Valhalla. Yeah, right. And and that we might not get to go to Valhalla. And I think that if we viewed those things, it's it's difficult to do because, as Dave and I did both pointed out, these things infuse all of our language and our discussion. Right. Which is why when people talk about teaching the Bible as a literary course because of its impact on history, I'm like, yes, you absolutely should do that. And some of my atheist friends are like, no, 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 no we shouldn't be teaching the Bible at all. And I'm like, teaching about the Bible's impact on history is not the same as teaching that it's true. Right. I mean, you could do this. I think at some point you could make an argument that we should do a, a study in, in schools about the impact of uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe on history. None of us are going to think it's true, but that's 2021 movies uh, so far of uh, just hot butter to awesome that have impacted more lives than probably mm-hmm. anything else that's been produced. I think you're dealing absolutely with... Agree. You're absolutely agree. dealing with agree. grief. Yeah. And it yeah. is, it's like a, the feeling you've won the lottery but then you haven't you've never had it in the first place and i i completely understand that but um the the reality is you won't know at the same time yes i I, i've always been an atheist and i understand all the arguments Mm -hmm. and i've always been comfortable with it right up until right up until you weren't my mom yeah you you get it on an intellectual level dave's right um how long ago did you lose your mom uh, middle of last year. Yeah. Yeah. You're just grieving, Mark. I think you're, you know, you're going to go through the grieving process and the reality of... Grieving, but half of it as well 
is struggling with mortality and I projected that onto myself and my mum has is gone and lost and she's lost her granddaughter my granddaughter um, so, so this may this may or may not help this may or may not help Mark but it's probably yeah. the best thing I'm going to come up with on the spot today mm -hmm. you can spend a good portion of the rest of your life focused and dwelling on your own concerns and fears and, and emotional views on mortality or you can just set that topic aside and go on and get about the rest of your life. That doesn't mean you love anybody any less. It doesn't mean you're pretending to have a solution. But how much better do you think your life's going to be if you spend it living than if you spend it focused on this, this uh, it, existential angst obsession. about um, uh, about morality? Uh, I know that I uh, absolutely agree, and that's absolutely where I am. And if you can take agree. if you can take and anything from our conversation today, I can, I can say well. I've got this, I need to do this, and I've got a family, and um, I've got a relationship, all this stuff, but the mortality thing is so preoccupying yeah. that I I can't lose it. I, I well, can't sort of, it's, it's too preoccupying, I don't know what to do with it. Rationally, I agree. I well, it's, a perfect, it's a perfect thing that you called in today, because I don't know that, yeah. uh, of the three of us... And, I'd, I'd Dave is the one that has the best reason to be yeah. preoccupied with mortality. Yeah, if you take nothing and I'm else... I'm going to feel guilty saying this to Dave because... Well, no, don't, I, don't, because I want you to hear me. If you take nothing else from our conversation today, we've, we've got these bracelets some of my friends came up with called their WWDD bracelets. What would Dave do? We kind of took right. off on the WWJD because that wasn't real, but this is. And so... Who the, wants Jack Daniels? No. Oh, because... Um, and it really means, uh, what, how would Dave respond to this particular situation? Would he be upset? Would he be anxious? You know, a woman in our group, local group, was frustrated one day at work and, and got to thinking, it was not long after my diagnosis, and she got to thinking, wow, Dave wouldn't be all frustrated about this thing. He wouldn't be uh, caught up in this anxiety and stuff. He would just be relaxed because he's got bigger things to worry about. And so we organically it came up, yeah, what would Dave do? WWDD. So... We've got these bracelets now, and people are getting them, and they're wearing them. And what that what it, what it's doing is is causing them to stop and take a breath and realize, wait a minute, what this thing is I'm caught up in about and all frustrated about is no big deal, because there are very few big deals in life, really, when you boil it down. And let's just focus on on life and living and and living our best life and grabbing the moments. So if you take nothing else from this, Mark, um, I, I'm I'm like. Like Matt said, I'm the one of the three of us who is facing death more squarely in the face. Yeah. And I'm not worried about it, dude, because it's, it's a beautiful life. And, and if I'm focused on my impending death and my own mortality, which is just a given fact for all of us, but if I'm only looking at that, I'm just going to miss life. And so if you can, uh, in the next days and weeks and months, I know... You know, like telling somebody not to think of that red elephant in the room makes you think about it. I know that you can't tell someone not to think of something. But as you're, as you're dwelling on it and as you're obsessing about it, if you can in different moments, just, just stop and think a minute. What would Dave do? How would he react to this? And try to get your mind moving forward away from your impending mortality because it's not going to help you any at all. And there's a lot of good life to be lived, and I want you to grab all the moments you can. You, you can wake up every morning and say... Uh, to, to nothing. Mom, I love you and I love life and I know that you'd want me to love life so I'm not going to dwell on this. And then go on about your day. Yep. Yeah, thanks. For yeah, I, obviously my mom's not there anymore and yeah. uh, from an atheistic point of view and I, I utterly agree and um, yeah, and I do have the thoughts you have um, seize the moment and life is short and that kind of thing but it's, I mean, it's led me to going to church and um, which sort of utterly compounded that mm -hmm. I think it's bullshit. Um, th there's just no option, and yeah. there's you you, you want an answer to something that doesn't have an answer. You want an answer to something that probably doesn't have an answer. No, 
this is this is how people ended up in in religions and and, and you know it's like oh well, I feel alone. Well, there's supposed comfort here. Well, I feel hopeless. Well, there's supposed hope here. Well, I don't know what happens after we live. Well, we've got an yeah. answer for that too. And you're at a point where it's extra frustrating because you think the answers are BS and that, that there may not actually be an answer. And getting comfortable with saying, yeah, I have no idea what's going to happen uh, at the end of my life or or even no, after. It's worse than that. It's, yeah. I, I feel there, there's there's nothing. I mean, the default is I don't believe there's anything after right. because there's no evidence. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I feel somehow we, as, as a community, I think Sam Harris, some of what he said has kind of helped me, but it's how do we, as an atheistic group or f- for me not believing in anything sort of come to terms with it and feel more happy about it and, and be able to sort of move on um if, if we are maybe the lie is that this is something, something. M- maybe the lie mark is that th- that you're supposed to be fine with it be happy with it and move on mm-hmm. um see even asking the question what can we as an atheist community do to make people you know be fine with their eventual it's oblivion? not fine you lost your mom be mad yeah, I, I'm going to die sad, someday. Mad, yeah. If you think I'm not irritated that I'm not going to live for as long as I want to, uh, you're, you're just wrong. I, you know, I have no idea when I'm going to die, but I know I'm not going to be around forever, and that's frustrating. Mm-hmm. But it's I, there's nothing I can do about it. It is a fact of life, and it would be a mistake for me to sit here and try to look for a pacifying or comforting explanation for something that isn't pacifying or comforting. That, that's my problem, utterly. And my mum died within two weeks of a diagnosis. Then I think, well, that could happen to me any time. Um, wow, shock, finite. You never know what's around the corner. And I'm certain of oblivion because there's no proof of anything else. So that's... that's Dave, what Dave are, are you okay with the fact that you're dying? Yeah. You're, you're okay with it? doesn't bother you that oh, you're dying? I'm pissed. I don't yeah, wanna, see, that's I don't want to leave, but I've I've accepted the reality of it. And I'm not focused on it. I'm focused on living yeah. and living my best life and grabbing the moments. But you bet I'm pissed. Yeah, I'm this pissed. This is why I feel kind of pathetic because Dave is... Don't. Wow. Don't feel... No, no. I'm, I, I I'm, don't even have that. I'm not... I'm happy that you called and I... Yeah. I went through all kinds of scans and stuff after my mum died because I thought, so I must be dying. Something's happening. So I went for heart tests. I went for mm-hmm. CT scans. Yeah. Right. Skin cancer, all this. And wow, nothing's come up and... I was you. looking for it, you know. That and should I, be comforting. I myself to Dave. Go live some yeah, life, buddy. I think, well, what about now? <laughs> okay. It's not rational. I know. I know it's not rational. Yeah, now, now you're delving into what may be like an unhealthy hypochondriac type mm-hmm. situation yeah. where, oh, my God, it could happen any time, so now I'm obsessed with it happening. Right. Yeah. Uh, I would like That's to say, reality, I, I'd like to I'm say saying. that you're going to get beyond that. I don't know that for sure. Mm-hmm. But I think we the fact that you're asking those questions and reaching out and, and seeking stuff out, I, I'm optimistic that it's something that you're ju- that's that's going to be less of an obsession and occupying less of your time mm-hmm. in the future. I hope so. absolutely. I hope so. And I I, I just wish there. Were, I mean, for me in the UK, there's there's nothing to deal with it. There's no counselling. Um, GPs will give you antidepressants. Have, have given me antidepressants. Have given me um, diazepam and all kinds of drugs. But there's no mechanism there's no counseling that's on offer to deal with anything and that's what i think somehow we need to get to mental health certainly in the uk i don't know what it's like in the u.s but it's a massive if, if you're talking about anything related to healthcare, it's um a mess a, a mess right right the same in the anyways US. i i apologize because we got full lines and like four minutes left on the no show at all uh no problem. i'm gonna move on but reach back out to us again let us know if Thanks, things improve Colin. Um, Thank you, guys. Yep. Yeah, cheers. It's, you know, it's one of those things where the guy's looking for answers. Maybe there is one. Maybe there's not. Maybe yeah. the answer's a drug. Maybe it's not. Maybe <laughs> the answer's counseling. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's starting a new relationship. Maybe it's not. All of us are different. We're going to handle it different. The important thing is that you shouldn't feel bad just because, you know, you are concerned about your, your mortality. We all should be. It just when it becomes an unhealthy obsession to the point where yeah. it ca- causes us to not enjoy life. If it's debilitating, then get some help. But yeah. having the feeling, having the emotion is, doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. we got Rose in Illinois who uh, has been here for a little bit. You're on with Dave and Matt, and I'm told that you have a scripture that can prove the existence of God. Yes. 
I'm not even sure how that's possible, but I'm, I can't I'm, wait. I can't wait. Hey, hold on. He's getting it. I've been waiting so long. And I've got to find my glasses. Okay. Oh. Is it? Is it? You've been waiting so long, and okay. Is this a scripture from the Bible? Yes, sir. Okay, I got one handy. And, and oh, Danny, where's my glasses? I'm looking for my thumb's glasses. I got do you, Do you know what the verse is? Because I can look it up. It's Matthew. Oh my God. Oh my God, why'd you say that? The most ridiculous of all the Gospels, and it shares my first name. <laughs> Have Ma you got oh it handy, bro? Matthew what? Uh, okay, okay. It's uh, Matthew 27. <laughs> After three days, I will rise again. Okay. Does that make any sense? All right, Matthew 27 what? Uh, Matthew 27, verse... Uh, 60, 63 at the very end. After three days, I will rise again. Yep. The next day, which He's followed the preparations day, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we, we, we remember that while this deceiver was still alive, he said, after three days, I will rise again. He's the only one that, it was, that died on the cross and then was buried and, and rose again after three days. None other of the people that worship, you know, like Buddha or Allah and blah, 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 have ever died and rose, rose again. Rose? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. What, what evidence do you have that, A, Jesus ever said this, B, Jesus rose from the dead? Oh, boy. I don't know, sir. I just, I, I read the Bible hmm? and I believe in Jesus. Do you believe in Buddha or Allah or whoever, whoever, whoever? I, I, I believe in Jesus. Okay. I, uh, I, I'm aware that, that you believe that. My question okay. was, how do we know it's true? You called in to say that you had a verse which proves the existence of God, and literally it's words in a book that nobody can verify anybody ever said other than that they were written down here. It's, if you have a red-letter edition of the Bible, uh, that's not going to necessarily be in red letters. There's no way to verify it, and you believe it because you also believe that Jesus rose from the dead after three days. But even the Bible doesn't have him rise from the dead after three days. It would have been from Friday night to Sunday morning. That's not three days. That's a day and a half. And actually, there's no no evidence that he rose from the dead, and it's difficult to even demonstrate reasonably that he actually existed, although I'm okay with that notion. But if somebody said, uh, I will rise again, uh, or after three days I will rise again, and then we killed them and they rose after three days, that would be incredibly impressive. I agree. But having a book that says somebody once said that after they were killed, they would rise again in three days, and I'm telling you that's what happened. Okay, so who do you know who wrote the book, Matthew? Uh, sir, can I just say this? What proof do you have that it didn't really happen? I don't have to prove it didn't really happen. Do I have to prove the butler didn't do it? If you say the butler oh, okay. did, if you say the butler did it, and I say I'm not convinced, what evidence do you have? And you come back with, well, can you prove the butler didn't do it? Don't you think that's sounds pretty stupid? Oh, golly. I, I didn't want to get into a confrontation about this. Okay. I, I'm just asking. I, I, I mean, no, if somebody yeah, said that to I, you, wouldn't you think that that was kind of a ridiculous question? Can you prove the butler didn't do it? Oh, golly. I guess I'm just going to have to try to keep trying to prove that it did happen. Yeah. And and since you since you didn't do that today, I think we can agree that you didn't prove it today, right? How, how would you go? I disagree. It, you, you think you proved it today? Well, I disagree with your theory on the fact that I didn't prove anything. Okay, so you think you did prove Those something? Yeah. I, I agree I with you that you proved I something. I just don't think you proved what you thought you proved. So what is it you think you proved? I proved that Jesus exists and... There's nothing, and, and there's been many miracles. I think Jesus exists. Show me a miracle. Oh, brother. Oh, where do you start? There's just so many of them. It's exactly. hard to pick, isn't it? Yeah. It's funny how people keep telling me there's all these miracles, and when I ask them to, to provide one so that we can examine it, 
it takes them forever. So, so what, what miracle do you think happened apart from the resurrection? Why are you such a meaning meanie? <laughs> yeah, Matt, why are you such a meaning? Just take it. Because I faith. give a fuck about whether or not something's true, and I'm tired of watching otherwise good and reasonable people be deluded into thinking no, that something is true. I, I, don't, I don't have to what? You don't have to cuss, Matt. Oh, for fuck's sake. What, <laughs> what, what exactly? Is, pro, is there a prohibition in your religion that I not say the word fuck? Rose, have you ever watched this show before? What's, no. What's, what's, what's so. wrong with the word fuck? Why shouldn't somebody say it? I don't know. I don't know either. My son, my son convinced me to call into your show. Your son's a dick. <laughs> It, it, I, and I mean this. I mean this in the in the meanest of all mean possible ways. If you are out there, is your son an atheist? My wife says he is. Okay, your son says he's an atheist, and he managed to convince you to call into this show. He's not being. kind I to guarantee you, you your son is not being kind to you. He wanted you to be publicly embarrassed, yeah, and not. I'm going to stop right now. Because yeah. I, I'm, we're, we're willing to have conversations. We're willing to talk about how and why we believe things. But I don't exist just so some atheist who's pissed off at his mom can send her here. I apologize, Rose, that you, you were duped like this because you're somebody who doesn't have um, – you're, you're like most other people on the planet. You believe something. The people around you believe it. You're convinced that it's true. You never really bothered to consider what sort of evidence should or shouldn't convince somebody. And you were sent in to a call-in show that is incredibly famous for taking un uh, credulous theistic beliefs and raking them over the coals. And your son owes you an apology. Yeah, and if your son's watching right now, dude, you need to do better. I would never have done this to I, my mom, and I talked I, about what my mom sent me for my birthday. I'm I'm right here, and like I do apologize to her and stuff, but I just she always comes to me with evidence for God, and you know yeah, that I you set her up, really dude. You set her up and threw her under the bus. That's not the way to do this. She, so I, no, irre, no. irrespective, irrespective of familiar relationship or anything else, do you love your mom? I. Yeah, I love her. Then learn how to talk to her and stop setting her up for shit like this. Yeah, good job, Matt. That's, that pisses me off. That's Gives us a bad name, man. When I read okay. the thing and, and talked about dealing with family members, um, I had a six-plus-hour conversation with my mom. And, and I'll be honest, my mom isn't any more equipped to have that conversation than Rose was. No, my mom didn't either. It would never have occurred to me to say, you know what, Mom, if you think you can keep proving God, call in and do it for this guy here. That's rude. What an I, I wouldn't even have sent her to Eric, and Eric's going to be as, as nice to her as anybody. That, mm. that, first of all, you're not in any way demonstrating that you're the more rational person or that your belief is rational or that their belief is irrational. I, I, I know that you're feeling bad about it, and I'm going to keep beating you up because I know you're listening. You should feel bad about it. Doesn't mean you're the worst person ever. Just learn. Apologize do to better. your mom. Learn. Do better. Do better. Do better, man. There's a better way to do this, and um, I hope you learn something. Yeah. We've got uh, Charlie in Arkansas. Thank you. You're on with Dave and Matt. I still got this. Oh, my gosh. Yep, yeah, sorry. He's got a problem with the sound. Yeah, I'm not going to waste Can't go there. any there. No. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm saving one for the last. So there's three calls left. We'll see if we can get through them fairly quickly. Ben in Oregon, you're on with Dave and Matt. Hello, Ben. Yes, I'm here. Hey, Ben. It says you're neither a theist nor an atheist. That's not possible. <laughs> um, but it also uh, says here that you give me you've discovered the cure for atheism and religion and that it is reality. I discovered the cure for atheism, religion, and agnosticism. I'm... 99.9% .9 on board with you. I've, I've literally... What the fuck makes years. you think atheism needs a cure? Yeah, that's my first problem with that. Uh, well, what I say, it's really sort of probably fit on a bumper sticker, is that I discovered the cure for atheism, religion, and agnosticism. I named it reality, which I know you love. <clears throat> you named it reality? So, so, no, stop, I, Ben, yeah, stop. But, uh, Are we talking about reality? Uh, you know, in the sense that I know... Please be nice. I think you'll, I, I think you'll agree. So just let me finish this. I think I'm going to hate this, and please, I already do, because Matt, you're like... Please be nice, Matt. All right. 
You're you've like been a meanie. Right. You've been Honestly, a meanie, I'm meanie already. I'm gonna let Dave take you because he's not a meanie. Go for it. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I love you, Matt. Okay. Ben loves you, Matt. I just don't care. I do. Oh, I'm a big fan. I just want him to have an open mind for a second because okay. it makes sense. Okay, go, a lot go. Of people have literally been rescuing people from religion. Okay, from, and atheism, way. evidently. But okay. go, go get to it. Get to it, Ben. We got. We're out of time. Uh, in a way, yes. I say that I discovered the cure for atheism, religion, and agnosticism. I named it reality. Just call whatever unknown phenomenon which caused existence God, which by definition, God would would be the definition of God. The lowest common denominator would be that which caused existence. I do not believe in a personal God. I believe, see, we get to now have the word God and use it. See, it's all, almost like we get to hijack the term God because that's the only real God is whatever has us here. Like, could it be the Big Bang? We don't know. Everybody's agnostic, whether they know it or not, except we can be Gnostic realists and realize reality. It's a thought. I've run it by Richard Carrier and Richard Dawkins, and they both are aware. And, and it literally just takes a little few brain cells. It brings a lot of people out of theism. I say take the, take a, take theism really? out of atheism. Really? You should no, no, write no, no, a book. No. You should write now a book. Now you're making... How many people have you brought out of theism with your cure for atheism? About 10 or 15. Cool. Call me when it's in the thousands. Because I'm unimpressed about what 10 or 15 will b b buy into. You're a meanie, meanie man. I am. I'm a, I'm a complete, I'm, I'm almost as big a dick as the guy that put his mom on the show, <laughs> except that I'm the one that's taking the calls and not the one that's making the calls. Seriously, I, ho I hope that guy will call back in and talk uh, reasonably. I mean, at, at another time. Yeah, not to, no, not today. We're no. way over time and no, there's still not today. two, two thieves to get. some other time. And one of them, one of them's got a, a challenge. But uh, uh, Chris in California, you're on with Dave and Matt. Hey, we can hear ourselves. What happened? He, he's listening to the show, and it's on delay, so we're waiting for him to catch up and turn off the okay. stream and listen okay. to the phone. Okay. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Yeah, hi. Hi, Matt. Hi, Dave. Yeah, we're all caught up. What's up? Um, yeah, I um, tried to narrow it down because they asked me if I had a question, and I had to go through my things and figure out what that might be. And I think what comes up in my mind is... Uh, to me, there's a spiritual aspect to our being, you know, with stuff you can't see. What, what's that mean? And whatever. I don't, I, I, I'm genuinely asking, and I, and I always say this because I've talked about this many times. The word spiritual is pretty much meaningless to me because it means so many different things to so many different people. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to use it, I'd just like to understand what you're talking about. Just, um, it's related to various things i mean it can be the soul that's living on or whatever it's uh chakras in a body um in that respect as well and see whatever is, is there anything that you, you don't believe uh, what do you mean the phenomena soul? what do you mean the soul anything i don't on? believe um because chakras aren't a real thing souls aren't a real thing yeah, what do you mean the soul that lives on you said that statement as though it was some something that everyone believes in it's a common thing. Well, I know a lot of people um, think it, but is it true? No. Uh, well, I yeah. guess I guess not. Okay, uh, I, I guess to, what I would say is that I, I default to everything's true. You know, like what's her name said. That's a movie? huge mistake. What oh, the hell does that true. mean? Everything's and, true. Yeah, that is and, the and it's true and, and, until maybe somebody says it's not. Okay, I'm, then I then I'm I'm telling you I'm that. telling you I'm telling you right now that what you believe. That everything is true is not true, which means you have to believe what I just said, which means you're wrong. Okay, well, besides that, I'm, I don't know if I can wrap my head around that one right away, but uh, probably not. I, I I I I do like to treat everything agnostically. I mean, I don't. I'm not convinced of anything. Well, you just said you time. start by believing everything's true. How can you be? How can they be your default well, position well, well, if well, you don't there, know? There's a degree of there's a degree of truth. I mean. What what the hell does that mean? I I think something's either well, true or it's not true, right? Well, well, t talk about this the spiritual aspect of being, or whatever this an unseen aspect to our being. Um, okay, what do you, that so is, unseen that, is that, that that I say forty to eighty percent I believe that or see it as probably forty true. to Sometimes eighty percent a wide gap there. Well, I believe it's somewhere between zero and zero percent. 
Okay. I mean, we have consciousness that we're alive, but that doesn't mean we have a soul or a spirit or something that lives on. I don't know why it, you would assume that's true because someone told you it was. I'm fine with the notion well, of a... Well, of well, a well, I'm well, fine. Well, I don't Hang on. True. You just said you did. You assumed everything is true until it's proven false. Well... I'm very confused. Okay. In, in, in my perception, as far as being absolutely true, nothing is true. <laughs> Except, except yeah. the physical things that I can I, have. That's exactly. Chris, Chris, except maybe Chris, the, Chris. Yeah, I'm gonna let you go. We're ten minutes over time. There's one more call to get to, and I don't want to take up any more of Dave's time. There's going to be food and stuff here, so go look up Liar's Paradox and some foundations in epistemology. Get your thoughts together and call back in another time. All right, Jason in Virginia, you are the last call. I thank you for w waiting this entire time. Uh, it says here that Whoa. well. It says, you are challenged to an epistemological debate. Is God a properly basic belief? Properly basic yeah, thank belief. you for taking my call. Are you um, familiar at all with the correspondence theory of truth? Yes. Okay. So, essentially, a properly basic belief is any belief that um, you can hold without evidence because of an experience, correct? Yeah, I pretty much reject the notion of properly basic beliefs because I think it's a, I think it's a way of hiding the fact that what you're really talking about is a presupposition of something that you do not have evidentiary warrant for. And so I don't think that anything's properly basic and certainly not an, a, a belief about the existence of a God um, an experience. would be properly basic. Yeah. And it's certainly if you want to say that X is properly basic because it's experiential, uh, then I certainly couldn't believe that a God exists because I haven't experienced that. Okay, well, you certainly um, leap to my next question, which is I was going to ask you if you're an empiricist, and it sounds like you kind of are. And so I would actually say that your experiences of God is what justifies God's existence. I don't have experiences so, of God. Well, I'm going to get to that because I actually, I looked back through a few of the episodes and I found out that you actually used to be a Christian. Is that correct? Yeah, and so did and I. Dave was a pastor. For 36 years. Okay. Okay, so at one point you say you felt as though you had an experience from God. Yes. Yes. And you no longer accept that? Yes. No. Oh, yes, I, no yes I no longer accept yes, that that no was an experience from God. I no longer accept that. Okay, okay, that's, that's great, that's great. So would you say that you can't trust our senses then? So independent of external confirmation— we know how unreliable our senses are and how unreliable our memory are, is. That, that, that's very important. Not just that we, that they are in fact unreliable. We know and can in many cases measure how unreliable they are. So when you look at something like um, optical illusions, visual illusions, auditory illusions, things like that, um, when you see a mirage, when you see all these other things, the way to determine how reliable your senses are in a particular instance is to investigate and get external confirmation, which is why we rely more on something like science, where I can do an experiment, Dave can do an experiment, we can compare results. And reality, it's been argued, are those things that don't go away when you stop believing in them and the things that you and I both believe in. See, I used well, to, we, as a charismatic evangelical Christian for many years, I used to speak in tongues. I could still do it right now. I could do it on air. I used to think that that was a gift given to me by the Holy Spirit. I now understand that to be my mind training my tongue and my mouth to do something. Our minds can, can think a certain number, a many number of things that we think are experiences with God that we can look back on and realize, okay, that was just my mind working in a certain way. There was no God involved with anything I was doing. Yeah, the big, the big point is that while our senses, in, in many philosophical circles, they would hold our senses as being properly basic because there's, because they recognize right. there's a problem in demonstrating the truth of what I experienced. And as Dave was and, and I were talking before the show, if Dave tells me his experience, I'm now, most people would say, oh, I'm getting secondhand information because I now ha have been relayed Dave's experience. So I didn't have that experience, but I have Dave's experience. But that's not true. Because what I have is my understanding of Dave's interpretation of, of experience. his experience. Right. So it's filtered twice. Now, 
the way to test that is if Dave tells me something that we cannot explore or investigate is to say, I don't necessarily know what the truth is here. I can make inferences based on other experiences and things like that. Or if Dave tells me something that we can potentially investigate, like how much money's in somebody's wallet or whatever else, then the, the key is to do the test. That's what lets you know how reliable your senses are. But I don't think they're properly basic and I don't think they're completely reliable. But I don't think they're all, I also don't think they are completely unreliable because that would lead to the extinction of everybody. Mm -hmm. Clear? I, I kind of see what you're saying here, but it seems to me that the epistemological reliability of atheism, as you put it anyways, is, is low because we could essentially be duped, even, even the no, scientism so, that you're trying to push here, you could Jason, be duped into thinking you're seeing something. Jason, atheism is not an affirmative position on a fact. It is a rejection of a theistic assertion. So it's n it's so w what I'm saying is if you claim a God exists, the butler did it, the sky is blue, whatever it is that you claim, you either have a way to support that with argument and evidence that can be convincing or you don't. And if you don't, the, the response is to say, ah, I remain unconvinced on this subject. And that's what atheism essentially is. Are there people who are convinced that there is no God? Yes. Are there people who claim to be absolutely certain that there is no God? Yes. I'm not one of those. I don't think we can be absolutely certain about anything. No. And so on the epistemological grounds, it's not atheism that requires any epistemological warrant. The only, the only epistemological warrant for my atheism is that theism has continually failed to meet its burden of proof. That's it. So you wouldn't consider millions of people or even multiple consistent beliefs from lots of different people to be evidence at all? Well, would you... Would it's you, evidence of what people believe. Yeah, would you consider the beliefs of millions of people of some other religion other than your own? Well, that's that's why I didn't want to say my specific religion. Because right, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. matter. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter because I'm talking about the God belief. But the question, the, the point see, is, the our question minds can think a number of different things. Think about the number of dreams you have. Do, do you th you think you think you're experiencing something in a dream because you're dreaming? And I had one last night that was weird as fuck. But does that mean that that happened to me, or what does that mean about anything in my life? Nothing. It means my mind is working overtime in some way that I don't understand. We experience we experience deja vu. We don't understand what that was. I'm writing a book. I'm trying to remember events from my childhood, and I'm trying to parse out which things do I actually remember happened and which things do I, am I trying to recall that someone else told me. And I'm actually trying to do that looking back uh, 50, 60 years. And so we, we get to what, what even the making of the Bible and people writing the, the events and words of Jesus some three or four or five, six decades later trying to remember what he said about a certain thing in a certain way and our minds are not capable of getting all this stuff right, and there's no way that we can depend on what our minds are thinking as, as some kind of basis for absolute truth. It's, it's independent confirmation that serves as essentially the best we have. Yeah. And so it's like if, if a god appeared right here in the studio, the first thing I would probably do after having this apparent experience vision is look at Dave and say, are you seeing the same thing I'm seeing? Let's mm -hmm. talk about what we're actually seeing. Right. That? You don't think that that religious people can do that with one another? Can they? Convince sure. Convince each other of stuff. Absolutely. Do they? Do they yeah, have? I, do I they have? Do they it. have skepticism and critical thinking skills sufficient to actually engage in this? So, D Dave here uh, talked about how he speaks in tongues. Jerry Dewitt's a friend of mine. Says that he has as well. I had a friend. I was not Pentecostal. I was not charismatic. I was Southern Baptist. But I would go to the charismatic Pentecostal church. We can fix church. that right now. We can. Yeah. Well, I would go because you guys would have the best concerts. You yeah. guys would have the like Carmen music. and Petra and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Now, I have a friend uh, who told me a story about his best friend growing up that in some Pentecostal churches, they expect you to be filled with the Holy Spirit at a certain age, an age of, is it like 13 or whatever? Yeah. Well, they would actually get the 13-year-olds up on stage and to show that they had been properly filled with the Spirit, they would all speak in tongues. And this kid looks okay. at the pastor and says, I don't know what to do. And the pastor said, just fake it. We all do. Now that, <laughs> that in no way should be viewed as a demonstration that everybody fakes it or everybody's aware no, that I thought it was it. legit. Uh, uh, of, of any of that. But the fact is people can believe something and be convinced of something and be in a group of people who are convinced of something and believe something, and that's wholly independent of whether or not their belief is actually warranted by it's the group think. And so when we talk about the existence of a God, all we need 
is an argument that is valid and sound with evidence supporting the premises. That's it. And I'm convinced. Can you do that? Um, I wouldn't say I have necessarily evidence, like a logical flow of evidence. You're talking about like an a priori knowledge, something justified through reason, right? Instead of no, a priori is not just a priori is, is essentially something that, that, that you start with as the belief. It comes before the evidence. Well, oh, a posteriori is after the evidence. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking for yes, a posteriori a-posteriori beliefs. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, sorry, I messed up the language there. That's right, but. You're, so you're looking for something that... Which you, reminds me, I have a correction for last week before we're done, but go ahead. Okay. Well, um, you're looking at something we can justify through testing and reason. I don't think I don't think that's really um, fair. Tough, tough, said. tough, 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 tough. Saying, so evidence and reason is the single most consistently reliable pathway we have to having an accurate understanding of reality. Mm-hmm. To say that the thing you believe is immune to that most robust, most diligent course of exploration is a problem with what you believe. It is not a problem with sound epistemology. You believe something for which there isn't sound epistemology, and that's not the fault of reason. Why is your God hiding from the sort of evidence that would demonstrate it exists, or testing that would demonstrate it exists? Well, I, I don't think he does hide at all. I, I think you... Where is he? This, in this, so in this call, you both already stated that you have these experiences... With the creator of the universe, no. for some reason. No, we said we at one we time we believed that experiences we, we had we were right. attributed to right. a God and we no longer believe because it. Because we were in circles that told us this is what this Are is. Are you suggesting that it was impossible for us to be wrong about those experiences? No, no, not at all. But what I'm okay. saying is, so you you believe that you were duped into thinking that you had an experience with this basically all-powerful being that is the controller of the universe, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And I'm pissed about that because I, well, gave, I okay. gave the best years of my life to it. And so now you don't. And so you're basically in this world where you're so easily duped into such a, such a, large, such a large belief, such a high consequence belief, if, it, if you want to call it. I, I, don't know, I don't know how easily duped it was. It was. I mean, this was childhood indoctrination yeah, and being when you're surrounded. Born in, when you're born into the culture and everyone around you believes the same thing and you want to fit in and you want to be in with the right crowd and do the right thing, of course, it's, yeah, you're, there's a lot of pressure there to follow that crowd. If, if I'd been born in Pakistan, I'd have, been, I'd have been raised as a Muslim. That's just the cultural bias that we grow up in. It's not easily duped, but we are. I think that's more of a de jure objection. I don't really think that those are... The, the, really point, the point is, so I'm not... The, the point of contention was about how easily it is to dupe us, but the bigger issue is, yes, I believed that I was falsely convinced to believe something that was a big deal, mm-hmm. and now I don't, and I know why I don't, and I can poke holes in the excuses and, and attempts at justification for this that the people who still believe it give. So if you're, thing, if, you're, if you're going down this road of, if you're so easily duped, how do you know you're not duped now? Which is where I think how, you were going. Yeah, exactly. How do you know that so you're not duped? So I'm not absolutely certain of anything, so I'm not absolutely certain that I'm not duped now. Mm-hmm. However... I am confident that I am more right than I used to be because the pathway that I found out, the, the pathway that led me out of that, was a demonstration of logical fallacy, special pleading, oh, God isn't subject to, to epistemology and tests, and all of those things that have you still duped. And the fact that it is such a big deal should lend credibility to the idea that we didn't take this lightly. It wasn't something that I just woke up one day and said, oh, okay, I, I'm yeah. mad at God. Screw no, this church Yeah, thing. I'm, I'm done with this stuff. Yeah. No, when you give 35, 36 years of your life to something and you go through the arduous tor- torture of discovery that it's not true and you wake up feeling isolated and lonely and angry and sad, uh, that's a big deal. It is a big deal. This stuff is a big deal. That's why we're here. That's why we're talking about this. But so, yeah, we were, we were tricked, and I'm pissed about it. This, this thing that you're, you've touched on, both with regard to whether or not beliefs are properly basic, whether or not we were duped, et cetera, all of this gets down to a, an incredibly fallacious argument, which is that the lack of absolute certainty, the lack of absolute confidence, the fact that we know we can be wrong, mm-hmm. somehow suggests that we're almost certainly wrong when that is absolutely not the case. And our continued existence means that we do at least have a marginally, passably, 
acceptable understanding of reality. When I go to cross the street, I'm not going to get hit by the invisible bus. And yet I have people calling in the show to suggest that somehow it's the problem of my epistemology that the invisible bus actually exists. It's just not subject to testing. Well, that belief actually would be subject to testing because you could have people walk across the street and nobody ever gets hit by the invisible bus. But, but the right? thing is, they're pointing at me saying you did just get hit by the invisible bus. You just don't feel it. I think you're, I think the fact that you said that you could test it by seeing that nobody gets hit by the invisible bus, well, I could say that nobody's hearing from the invisible God, and the invisible God is not showing up, and I know hundreds of thousands of people that have begged him to for years for very serious things, and he hasn't showed up, so, he doesn't show up. So do show I, up. and I know hundreds of thousands of people who got an answer, so I don't oh. think... No, 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 you I'd know hundreds of thousands of people who think and claim they've gotten answers. I'd love to see You haven't answers. demonstrated anybody who's actually got an answer yeah. from God. bring it. And, and here's the thing. People will email me. Oh, I said, here's the thing again. People will email me along these lines, and I tell most of them the same thing. And so I'm going to ask you a couple questions. This may not fit you, Jason. Okay. When you talk to God, does God answer you? I would say yes. Okay. Do you think that God wants me to know he exists? I would say he does. Okay. But he doesn't Have you really asked him? Push you. If you asked him, do you think that he would answer that question? Well, you're getting kind of into my theological knowledge. Of yes, because that's the thing that's that I... different from... If you're going to call into... So this is about whether or not you have good reasons for this. So do you think that God would answer that question for you? I do. Okay. Then I need you to go ask God what you should say to me next and then call back the next time I'm on with the answer that you got from God. And that should be a really good test because if your God is in fact God and knows me, and know, then that God should know exactly what you should say to me to convince me to pay more attention to what you're saying or even change my mind about that God's existence. And if that God doesn't answer you, then at least you're wrong about whether or not God is answering questions. Or you could okay. cut out the middleman altogether and just ask God to speak to Matt directly. That would be nice, but I'm willing, I, I, that was what I used to do. <laughs> Why hasn't God appeared to me? Why is the Damascus Road experience good enough for Saul, assuming we're talking about Christianity? And I'm, I'm not necessarily making that assumption. That's why I asked about what you think God would do. If there is a God, I'm fine with that God relaying a message to me through I'm another to person. Too. I'm here. Come on, God. Bring, because bring your best. if I were God, I could absolutely tell Dave exactly what you need to hear. Mm -hmm. The secret thing that only Matt knows that would be the thing that, Matt, that would get Matt's attention and he would know without a doubt that God is real and God wants him to give him his life back. Yep. God would know that secret thing that only Matt knows. And if you've got a hotline to God and he, asks, he answers your prayers, you could ask him tonight and he could reveal that to you and you could call Matt next week and this show would shut down. Well, I would have to well, leave the show. <laughs> then we'd have, to, we'd have to do that same experiment for the others. I apologize. I have to let you go. We're like a half hour Thank over you, Jason. time. Okay. Call us back another time, especially if you hear from your God. <laughs> uh, by, the, by the way, that thing's open to any of you. I realize I'm opening the floodgates for email. Here we go. But uh, I've, I've put this question out there lots of times. And what ends up happening is I either never hear from the person. They come back with a message. A that, Bible verse. Uh, a Bible verse in Pascal's wager. They, mm -hmm. they come back with the level of what Rose was going to actually present. And uh, if that's... I mean, if that's a message from God, your God is intentionally trying to keep me as a non-believer and because he's coming off as a doofus. I have one correction uh, from last week's show. Um, there was a discussion about uh, if P, then not P. And uh, I was at least partially incorrect. Uh, I tried to get to the point in this discussion. Essentially, that is a a valid shorthand version of the reductio ad absurdum that I mentioned. And in in normative senses, if you were to flesh it all out in a syllogism, you'd have if P then Q, Q er, P implies Q, Q implies not P, and therefore you shorthand all that up and you get P implies not P. The problem in part was with the phrasing that the individual presented, and I was thinking it in terms of uh, actual uh, epistemic or, or a materialistic thing that if X exists, then X does not exist, and that, of course, is a contradiction. That is the purpose, and what he should have said was, if we assume for the sake of argument that X exists, it leads us to a contradiction, then cool, we're at the reductio ad absurdum that we were all talking about. So my apologies for, for confusing things about that shorthand. It is a if P, then not P. Essentially means P implies that not P, or the existence of this, if we assume it, implies 
somewhere down the road that it doesn't exist by contradiction. A proof by contradiction is, is, is a great way to show that what you believe isn't true. Uh, it's not a great way to show that what you believe is true. But that's a longer logic discussion. Dave, thanks so much for, for doing this today. This was outstanding. My pleasure, my friend. I want to get you back down here, maybe get you here for the back cruise. Maybe just have you stop by Austin on occasion, sit in and answer calls. I'd love that, man. That'd be great. This has been blast. blast. We appreciate all you people uh, who hung with us for a full hour and a half. The people on the other side of the glass are all hungry. People on that side of the wall who actually do all the work, there's our there crew back are, in there, there, there answering are. phones, Woo! giving a round of applause. Uh, Atheist Experience will be back next Sunday. The Atheist Community of Austin is open seven days a week. The Bat Cruise is coming up. If you are going to be in the Austin area or can make an excuse to be in the Austin area, what the fuck is taking you so long? Come on down, hang out with us. We're having a good time, and now it's time to eat. See you later. <laughs>